can't help but see in that passage that was read for us how God works in people's lives. How God enters into the affairs of human beings to bring about His will on various occasions. We talked in Bible class this morning from Luke chapter 11 about uh, the model prayer where Jesus said to pray that God would give us our daily bread or give us our bread day by day. Talk about that providence of God. And, but here, providence of God, but just not for those who believe, but for everybody. The potential is there for each and every person become acquainted with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to be able to obey Him for salvation, to hear and understand and obey the gospel, to be born again as a child of God, and, and to have that relationship with Him. He says He'll be with us to the end of the age. And not only that, if found worthy, when this life is over, He will give us a home in heaven with Him for eternity. Those are things that we look to. Those are things that we hope for. Those are things that bring great joy into our lives. And it starts with the joy that was seen around this one particular event that took place a little over 2,000 years ago. Yes, we divide history by it, don't we? We divide history by the coming of Jesus Christ, by the birth of Jesus. Now, shortly before the birth of Jesus, God had set things up in a tremendous way. He set up the world so that when He did bring the Messiah into the world, many things would already be in place. Didn't have to go build roads for the the disciples to take the gospel into all the world, that had already been accomplished through the Roman Empire. Didn't have to get everybody to speak a one language, basically, to understand it all. God had already taken care of that in the Greek Empire. Because Greek was the language of the world at that time. If you spoke Roman you also, or Latin, you also spoke Greek. If you spoke Hebrew, you probably also spoke Greek because that's what people did in those days. So many things. Laws. Laws that cannot be undone come with the Medo-Persian Empire. The, the, the concept of a kingdom, an empire that's far-reaching came with the... Uh, uh, Babylonian Empire. All those refer back to Daniel's, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2. See, God working for all those years. And then it comes down to this particular time, see. For some reason, Augustus Caesar issued a decree of taxation that sent Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Not keeping them in Nazareth to Nazareth to register and pay their taxes, but to go to Bethlehem. And all the people would be there. That was Joseph's ancestral home. That was the, the place where David was born. That's where the kings and those uh, heirs of the kings came from. And that brings Jesus to Bethlehem to be born and to fulfill the scriptures to be born in a manger because there's no room in the end and for great things to happen powerful things to happen amazing things to happen as the message comes out by the angelic host proclaiming that the savior of the world is born what a wonderful time that was. And this morning we want to look at the message of the birth of Jesus Christ and see how that has come to this world of sin and sorrow as a message of joy. Glad tidings of joy. What is it that the angel said? And the angel said unto the shepherds, 
Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. But see, it comes first to these shepherds. Examine some of the people who are involved in what we come to call the Christmas story. Well, we don't come to call it that. It's what's been handed down to us as tradition. And we know the tradition is, as in most cases, far from the truth. But yet, look at what is going on here. Here comes an angel of the Lord, and a multitude of angels appeared to him, uh, to, to them. And, and these, this angel and this multitude of angels have not gone to Jerusalem, where the king is. This angel did not go to Jerusalem where the temple was. Did not go to the chief priests and the elders. Didn't go to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or any other of those groups. But came to people who knew that they needed to save them. And we're looking for a savior. Not someone like the Herodians who wanted to kill him. Didn't come to the chief priest who denied him and turned him over to the Romans to be crucified. Came to the shepherds. And he came to the shepherd with that message. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yes, there is a reason to be afraid of God. That's if we don't believe in Him and obey Him through His Son Jesus in this life. We've got a reason to be afraid, but don't be afraid. He's come to save us. He's come to take away our sins and to make us pure before Him and to be able to live righteous lives before Him. So there's no reason to fear Him. But they, they were afraid to a degree because nobody had seen anything like this going on for at least 400 years. So while everybody else said, Everybody else was consumed with the ideas and the thoughts of this taxation that Caesar had brought. So, oh, this is a terrible thing. We got to travel here. We got to do this. We got to pay these taxes. Here, are these shepherds, they're just out doing their job. Just out doing their job. And the angel appears to them. Now, angels often appear in the Bible as men and. And in many cases, they bring no fear or no dread. But this angel, this, this angel appeared with the glory of the Lord shining about him. This was something great. And the rest of those angels, as they joined in chorus and sang about the birth of the Messiah, see, what they were doing was inspiring in these humble men a sense of the power of God and the greatness of the hour. Why wouldn't they worship? Because something great was happening in their lives. Many times we come to the church building and we sit like bumps on the wall. <coughs> Because we don't see anything great going on in our lives. And the reason? We're not looking for anything great. We're worried about the taxation, aren't we? We're worried about this movement. We're worried about that movement. And we worry about those things and we don't think about God. And we don't think about Jesus and what He's done. See, the rulers in Jerusalem allowed the greatest event in the history of the world to just slip right by them. They missed the birth of the Messiah. What their scriptures had prophesied for since the beginning, they had the written word for 1,500 years. This was going to happen. Elements all the way through it. 
And many people knew, many people understood, and they were waiting, but not the leaders, not the elders, not the priests. No, no they, they didn't want things to change. They think, just stay the same. Stay the same. So that's why God sent the angels to the shepherds, because they would willingly accept the Messiah. They would take that event that they witnessed to all the world. They'd tell it to everybody. They'd tell it to their children. They'd tell it to their grandchildren. Yes, I was there. I, the, when Jesus was born, the angel appeared, and I went to Bethlehem, and I got on my knees, and I worshipped the Son of God who came as a human being. They were sore afraid. Okay. Sore afraid of what this all meant. Because the first thing we think about with God is often judgment and not mercy. Not the mercy of God. The judgment of God does bring fear, but God's mercy, what God does, that brings great joy. And we get to rejoice because of what God has done. Now, soon after the appearance of the star at Jesus' birth, wise men from the east started a journey that took about two years for them to get to Jerusalem to ask about, inquire about, this one who was born the king of the Jews. Two years later, the king still didn't know about it. Two years later, his advisor still didn't know about it. Two years later, the king decides he's going to kill this one if he gets a chance. You see why God sent the angel to the people that he sent the angels to? God working in, in people's lives. But what did they do when they went to Nazareth? I believe it's in Nazareth. Jesus is two years old, and they find him at the house. What do they do? They worship him. They worship him. The Gentiles. They weren't Jews from Babylon or over in the East Country. They were Gentiles. There are people who knew for some reason, I believe it was because of Daniel's preaching and teaching 500 years earlier, that they knew somebody special was coming. They saw the signs and they came and they worshipped him. And when they realized that Satan was working through Herod and the elders to destroy him, they left and went home and died away. But you know what? They went home rejoicing. They went home rejoicing because hope had come into the world. Then we learn of the object of the angel's proclamation, for unto you is born this day in the city of David the Savior, which is Christ. The Lord. See, Luke. Luke shows the time, the place, the special circumstances involved in Jesus' birth. And he has two reasons for doing so. Number one, to prove that Jesus was truly a historical figure. Not a fairy tale. Not over here in Never Never Land. Not over here in some other place that you just got to imagine about. No, at a place and a time in history with real people, Augustus Caesar, with Herod as the king, with Quirinius as governor. It's all historical because God wants us to know this happened. This happened. And that's the reason for joy. And secondly is to prove that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. Nobody else, nobody else, fulfills those prophecies. And if you just stop right there with the birth of Jesus, that ought to be enough. But you go on. How about his death, burial, and resurrection is prophesied in the Old Testament. 
What about the way that he lived his life? What about the, the way that he's ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of the throne of God? And the angel said unto the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. But see, the birth of Jesus was itself good news, but very good news. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23 shall call him Emmanuel which means God with us. No. God with us. God with human beings. God in the flesh. Here He is. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14. The birth of Jesus Christ coming to those Jews who were looking for it, had been looking for it for centuries, see? It was great joy because now God has come to dwell with them. They thought God was dwelling in the temple. It was only the presence of God that was there. God said, I'm coming to dwell with you. I'm going to be there. You see, over the period of about six, almost 600 years, with the temple destroyed, they tended to just blow that off. Well, apparently God couldn't do it. Apparently we were reading that wrong. Apparently we just didn't understand what God was doing. And then God comes and does what He says He's going to do. Yeah, great joy that is there. The birth of Jesus was the beginning of God's attack on Satan and evil. So wait a minute, I thought, the, I thought Israel was, and I thought the law of Moses was. No, that was a stopgap measure. That was a stopgap measure. That was to teach men that God is serious about sin and about death. But this was the first shot, basically, in that, that great war against evil, against Satan. He came to bring light, which is knowledge of God's world, into a world of darkness. The world hasn't gotten any better. It hasn't. But see, we, having a knowledge of that light, can have great joy. He came to redeem us from iniquity through His sacrifice on the cross. There was no forgiveness of sins before. We can have it. Yes, sin still runs rampant in this world. Doesn't mean we have to be a part of it. In fact, Jesus said His people would run away from it. His people, if they got caught in it, would repent and confess it and ask for forgiveness. We're not supposed to walk in darkness. He came to destroy the work of the devil, which is death, by rising from the dead. And he said, and the scriptures say, that as he rose from the dead, so will we, and will rise to judgment. Now, now salvation is revealed in the New Testament, sanctified and sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, that baby who was born in Bethlehem in the manger and the angels told the shepherds to come and see him and the wise men come two years later and see him. Yes, they killed him. They crucified him and put him on a cross. And that just took away everybody's joy, didn't it? It's not the end of the story. Because he rose again the third day to ascend to heaven, to assume his rightful place on the throne of heaven, in heaven, to rule over his kingdom on earth. And we can be a part of that 
kingdom. Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Yes, even today, people are pressing into it. Why? Because there are still some people today who are interested in salvation. Their salvation. Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, this is to the Jews on the day of Pentecost, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That baby who was born in Bethlehem, and the angels announced it to the shepherds, and they came and they worshipped him, and the wise men came from the east two years later and found him and worshipped him, and they hung him on a cross, the Jews and the Romans, Jews and Gentiles alike. And he rose again the third day. And now when we submit ourselves to the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism, we rise to walk in newness of life also. Not in darkness, not in sin, and not under the fear of death and eternal destruction. The good tidings of great joy for what He has done for us. Sometimes we miss that when we talk about Christmas and we forget that Jesus grew up and what happened to Him. And the angel said unto the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. The coming of Christ was great joy to the faithful under the old covenant. They lived only in the hope that the Messiah would come, and finally, for the ones who were faithful, finally remove sin. For the ones who weren't faithful, they had all kinds of ideas about what the Messiah would do, but the faithful understood He was coming to do away with sin. Look down, this is verse 25. Let me look here. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came in by the Spirit into the temple, and when his parents, this is Jesus' parents, brought him in, or brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of law. He, Simeon, took him up in his arms and blessed him and said, And now, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people to Israel. That's where the true joy comes in, isn't it? That salvation has been provided to us if we will simply accept it. The coming of Christ is great joy for the church. I read to you Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 what the response to the gospel message needed to be. How we obey the gospel by repenting and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. But what did that bring to the people? Acts chapter 2 and verses 46 and 47. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. It continued on, didn't it? It continued on, and it continues on even today as the kingdom grows. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4, These things we write unto you, <coughs> that your joy may be full. Did any 
angels came and said to the shepherds, I bring you, we bring you glad tidings of great joy. The wise men came and found it, as did the shepherds. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said, here's how you obey the gospel once you believe it. And there was great joy for them. And I'm here to tell you there's great joy for you. If you'll understand it. If you'll accept it. If you'll believe the gospel and obey the gospel, that joy can be yours. And through the great good tidings of great joy, God delivered all people. See, it's for all people. It was delivered for all people. But not everyone shares in that joy that we have in Christ Jesus. Why not? John chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received them, to them he gave the right to become, or the power to become, the children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He came to his own. He came to the people who were supposed to believe in him and accept him, and they did not believe him. They did not accept him. But the ones who did, they're the ones who received the joy. The joy. The joy that everybody talks about Christmas, but they don't understand it, do they? Because they don't understand God's Word. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's where the joy is. That's where you've got to go. That's where you've got to be to receive this joy the way that God desires you to have it. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, I'll give you the opportunity to become a child of God so that this message <coughs> delivered by angels, recorded in the Scriptures, and yes, in a meek and beggarly way has been given to you by me this morning. and know the joy that God desires for you to have. Thank you for your time. If you have need, please come. Take a seat here in the front as we stand and sing.